This is what democracy. I apologize. I started prematurely. Um, but the title of the conference is This is What Democracy Looks Like. In just a few moments, we will be starting our first session for the day entitled Under Scrutiny. For today's session and throughout the conference, we ask that you use the Q&A feature to submit questions for the presenter. You can find that button by hovering your cursor in the middle of the Zoom screen below the slides. There is an option to ask your question anonymously and the presenter will ask as, will answer as many questions as can um, as we can uh, during the time that we have. Today's session will be recorded and will be available on the slurp.info in the coming weeks. The chat will remain open throughout the entirety of the session and please feel free to engage with your fellow participants in that chat. Closed captioning is enabled and available. Now, let me introduce you to the session presenter, Darcy Lip Accord. Her pronouns are she, her, and hers. Darcy Lip Accord has been the Youth Services Librarian at Campbell County Public Library in Gillette, Wyoming since 2016. For the past two plus years, she has been directly involved in dealing with the community's controversies surrounding materials found in the children's and teen sections of the public library. She has presented her work at the Wyoming Library Association, as well as the Yalsa Conference and for a, an ALA webinar, and at other library systems throughout the country. She is currently serving as the president of the Wyoming Library Association. Welcome, Darcy. There I am. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me and inviting me. I have, I think, a lot to talk to you about. So I'm going to just jump right into sharing my screen and getting um, going on this morning's presentation. So um, yes, this is a, uh, I kind of went a little further. This is a webinar entitled Under Scrutiny, Helping Staff Feel Safe in the Face of Book Challenges. Um, and we'll kind of delve into why that's titled the way it is, I think, during the presentation today. I am um, currently the Youth Services Librarian at Campbell County Public Library in Gillette, Wyoming, which has been in national news for the last uh, two plus years. Um, prior to that, um, I mean, I, prior to being Youth Services Librarian, I did work primarily with teens in, in a uh, coordinator position, and I do have a background in education. I wanted to just tell you that the intentions of this presentation are to just do a summary of what happened in my community and library system, just to set the tone, not to delve into real specifics. I don't have the time for that. But um, looking at what happened at, historically to explain some common tactics that we are seeing and patterns that we are seeing in challenges and in book banning efforts across the nation. And then finally to wait, explore ways to empower staff um, and provide a better chance for psychological safety in the face of these kinds of challenges. Um, so here in Campbell County, um, Wyoming, we, uh, in Gillette particularly, so much different from probably where you're at. Campbell County is um, about 100 miles long and 40 miles wide. We have uh, approximately a population in town in Gillette, which is the only major city in the county of about 55,000 people in the county overall closer to 75 or 80,000 people. I know that's probably very small, very rural. Um, <clears throat> and that factors into, I think, a little bit of what's happened here. Our experiences began officially in July of 2021. Um, however, I, I, and I will talk about this, I think there had been, um, indicators of this prior to that. It continues to be a controversy. It, nothing has been resolved yet. Some important events and patterns, as, it, as I said, just to kind of set this in, uh, in patterns that we're seeing nationwide. Um, this began with outrage at LGBTQIA plus titles, as well as 
um, me hiring a magician for a summer reading performance who happened to be transgender. That rhetoric now um, has changed to target sexually explicit titles. And it's an interesting change of rhetoric. I don't think the actual um, focus has changed. Um, we've seen a lot of very homophobic and transphobic assertions and comments at many public meetings, just um, horrifying kinds of things that are being said. Uh, lots of, I, I, don't, I don't have this as a bullet point, but indicative of a lot of um, lack of knowledge about diversity, about um, LGBTQIA plus people, it, just very, very um, phobia-based, fear-based. Uh, a lot of lack of knowledge about library policies and procedures, about the difference between school and public, about what a public library does. Just these people who are primarily behind these challenges in our community, at least, are not library users. Um, we also very early on discovered the involvement of an outside hate group, which has definitely had a huge factor in what's going on here. Um, we did have an attempt to prosecute under our Wyoming criminal code. Um, that attempt to prosecute happened against my former director and the library system in October of 2021. It was dismissed. There was um, a, a legal opinion written that stated that there was not any um, evidence to prosecute. Following that, um, there was last year um, in 2023 in our legislative session, we're on a biennial legislative cycle here in Wyoming, there was an attempt to remove an exemption, um, an obscenity exemption, exemption from the criminal code to prosecute for obscenity. We have an exemption for school and public librarians, museums, and universities in Wyoming that states that, um, you know, essentially we cannot be prosecuted for providing obscenity in the course of our um, actual professional jobs. Um, many, many attacks on books and getting down in the weeds about individual book titles and now streaming content has come into play with many, many, many passages being taken out of context. I think we see that all over. Lots of rhetoric around protecting the children and saving the children. Lots of rhetoric also around parental rights. Um, more recently, we've seen some very politically motivated board appointments and um, <clears throat> involvement of groups that are outside of our county, including the retention of legal counsel by our current library board that is separate from our county attorney. And I should just put a pause here for a minute and state that when the controversy began in 2021, our five member library board, which is under Wyoming statute appointed by our county commission was um, four to one essentially supportive of the librarians and the library. Um, and they are the board that refuted a lot of the challenges or heard a lot of the appeals that came um, at the very beginning of this controversy, that board has very much changed and swung in the very opposite direction to the point where we now have an appointed board that is four to one, very much against um, intellectual freedom and against our public library um, and the librarians. That board, the most the most recent iteration, the current iteration of our board, decided in October of last year to disassociate as an institution from the American Library Association and the Wyoming Library Association. Um, individual librarians, of course, can still be members, but there is no county um, money allocated for any activities having to do with ALA or WLA. Um, that board also began with that outside legal counsel as a as an advisor to revise our collection development policy. That is still in process. Very interesting to see some of the revisions they've made. Um, they most recently have started to assert that problematic titles that qualify under their 
um, sexual explicit parameters. I, I do have to explain that. The revision of the collection development policy essentially has tried to define sexually explicit materials and has made a statement that materials for children and teens that meet that definition will not be included in our library collection. And the parameters by which they're trying to define the sexually explicit materials are the same that one might, one can find in the Children Internet Protection Act. They took the language straight out of the Child Internet Protection Act out of CIPA. Um, so with that language, they began to make the assertion last summer that titles should be removed via deselection by us weeding them out rather than using any kind of a reconsideration process. My former director, <clears throat> um, pointed out that that would put her and staff in violation of the First Amendment and refused to do that. And that led to her termination in July of this last year of 2023. So we have been about three months without an executive director. We have a new one coming on board in November. The story continues. During all of this, I think, um, there have been a lot of pressure tactics. These were first targeted at, remember I told you that the board we had when this began was a very different board than what we had now. So these pressure tactics were um, targeting that board and then staff members, my director, myself, a few other staff members. Those pressure tactics or protester tactics included, um, as I said, very homophobic, transphobic and library ignorant comments at public comment sessions of public meetings. And that's not just library board meetings, but county commission meetings as well. Lots of signs that were brought in calling, you know, protester signs calling for resignations, a billboard such as the one that you see on your screen, which was by our local subway, social media campaigns, which would include stalking people's social media pages and um, targeting them there email and online disinformation. So a website popped up, but there was also a, a large email, several websites actually popped up. There were several large email chains that were slanderous, um, libelous towards the library or library personnel. Questioning of library policies and procedures that had nothing to do with collection development, um, our, our policies regarding um, how we use our youth areas, things like that them loitering in youth areas, even though, as I said, oh, I may not have said that, many of them were not actually caregivers. Many of them were not actually parents or grandparents of library patrons. Um, harassment of staff members outside of the library was very common. And some politically motivated book donation attempts, and um, often they were books that I would not collect per our collection development parameters. And my refusal to add them to the collection was skewed as um, indicative of bias. So here were common staff responses to the kinds of pressure that was going on. And it was really very much a pressure cooker, um, especially I would say in the first six to eight months of this going on, pro probably the first year of this going on. Some things kind of relieved the pressure after about a year. Anyway, um, as librarians do, we want to correct misinformation. So we were confused at some of their perceptions and just earnestly attempted to correct that misinformation, engaged in a lot of unproductive conversations that way. Um, we wanted to use logic, have reasonable conversations. When those did not come to any kind of fruition or any kind of good resolution, of course, the staff have emotional response, responses, lots of anger at being painted with a very, very negative brush, um, sense of betrayal because we are a relatively small community in a small state. Um, shame came into play because um, a lot of the uh, rhetoric was around religion and similar religious upbringings. And of course, fear, fear for jobs, fear for fear of just being attacked in the course of doing, you know, our day to day work, um, things like that. The ongoing stress led to a lot of us taking on too much of the fight and a sense of overwhelm. 
For some people, there was cognitive dissonance, which it was an unwillingness to see the reality of the situation. Again, we are in a smallish community. These are people that our library staff know from other areas of their lives, from church, from kids sports, from whatever community organizations. And these people were being um, abusive and, and it was an unwillingness to, to see that their behavior was not okay. On, on some staff, particularly a lot of our paraprofessionals and um, in my system, <clears throat> I think there are, I can count on probably two hands, the number of staff who have an MLIS. Um, most, of a, most of our staff is paraprofessionals and not all have a really good background in library services. So for them, there was a lot of, why don't you just compromise? Why don't you just get rid of the books, make it go away, make it stop. And then of course, we've seen some people just leave the profession. I have seen, in my system, um, I've had several people retire, it, whether they were going to, you know, they weren't going to yet, but they decided it was time. I've seen a couple leave to other systems. And then I've had a couple staff members leave youth services because that is of course the area of our library, the most under scrutiny and go to other departments. So how do we deal with this so that we keep staff feeling safe and able to do their jobs so that we don't see this massive exodus from the profession? Because honestly, I think solving some of the issues that we're facing is beyond the, the capability of our day-to-day -day frontline staff. So there, I, th I think of it as two fronts of empowering staff, and I think we need to focus on both. My presentation focuses on one over the other, but, I'm, but that doesn't mean it's less important. It's just that we talk about the, um, we talk about the library service perspective a lot, but we don't talk about a trauma-informed and psychological safety perspective enough. So these two fronts, are both important. It's like two wings of a bird. You could not have one without the other. We do need to know about the legal and professional help that is available um, via the ALA, the Freedom to Read Foundation, Office of Intellectual Freedom of the ALA, via coalitions with other professional organizations, via the courts and legislation. There's court, there's case law that supports intellectual freedom and supports the constitutional librarianship that most of us practice. We do need to know about our library policies and make sure that they are um, uh, robust and, and well-written and, and a tackle this problem from our traditional library service perspective, which is what most of us learned about in library school, which is what most of us are the most familiar with. But in order to support staff in a day-to-day -day environment, and especially when you have staff that are maybe in a paraprofessional role, I think we also need to think about wellness support. That includes identifying abusive behaviors, putting an emphasis on psychological safety, giving them some knowledge and training regarding how to deal with these behaviors, thinking about library um, policies and procedures, our, our workflow in terms of day-to-day -day support and adopting something of a trauma-informed perspective. Let me talk just a few minutes about from a library service perspective. I'm just speaking from experience here that these are the kinds of things that I think everyone in your library system needs to be, if not fluent in, at least familiar enough with that you don't have a misinformation risk or a credibility risk by someone of your staff um, not speaking correctly, not speaking um, with adequate knowledge. So this would include making sure everyone knows the mission of their library system. And for us, it's to meet educational and recreational information needs of individual populations. Knowing what the demographics of your service area are and how important representation on the shelf is, which I'm sure in this conference you speak about a lot. 
knowing what your collection development and management policies are and how that is done and making sure that the resources that you actually do collect are defensible by that policy, that they fit within the parameters that you've already stated in the policy. Also knowing the circulation or having an idea of the circulation of materials is important. When we first started to have the attacks on these LGBTQIA plus titles, the people in our community that were doing the challenging were making a blanket assumption that we were simply putting these things on the shelf in an effort to indoctrinate children and that they were not actually circulating. And the circulation numbers absolutely um, <clears throat> validated that we needed to have materials on the shelf and, the, and that their position was completely incorrect. Um, people should know a little bit about information seeking behavior and particularly of youth and teens, how important discoverability is in that population and how to remove barriers to access. Um, maybe we'll get time to talk a little bit more about that in the Q&A. Uh, also knowing library policies and procedures regarding reconsideration and regarding your policies for serving youth. I've had staff members who do not work with my department who are more like administrative staff members completely misstate how we, for example, how our teen services department works to the point that parents have come to me, a parent has come to me angry because this particular staff person gave him misinformation and he thought that we were watching what his teen was getting onto on our internet computers. So making sure that your your um, all your staff can speak correctly. Um, intellectual freedom basics, knowing about the First Amendment, and I just listed some places where you could maybe get some more resources for that. That's not the purpose of my discussion today. Knowing case law regarding access, particularly to youth materials, two famous cases that might be worth looking up our Island Tree School District versus Pico, and then Sund versus the city of Wichita Falls, Texas. Um, customer service skills, and that's what I'm going to talk about here in a second. Some assertiveness training and awareness of abusive behavior, particularly for your frontline staff who are dealing with the public. So that's from a library service perspective. From a trauma-informed perspective, then we have to empower staff by thinking about safety. And it is not my place because I'm in um, a very different uh, library situation than I would presume some of you are. It's not my place to talk about physical safety. That's for directors and managers of individual buildings and systems to think about. But some, but when we talk about psychological safety, that means the ability to show up and handle our job in an emotional, in a, in a um, professional way when emotions are triggered. And we have to keep this in mind when we're having staff dealing with these behaviors that are very um, abusive. So I have been teaching staff to prioritize their psychological and physical safety by thinking about, are you safe to have this interaction with this person? Are other staff around you safe? Are the other citizens and patrons who are in the area safe? Do you, know, do they need to, do you need to shut a conversation down so that they don't have to hear it? and then go into a customer service perspective. Some of us of my generation or older generations, we've always been taught to just um, put the customer first and that's fine for de-escalating a situation, but it is not fine when it makes you agree to things or you agree with a person who is abusing you. Um, we have to recognize that with all of us, we are emotional creatures and we all probably carry some trauma with us. A lot of the behaviors um, that, that we see these abusers engaging in may trigger reactions that are in, you know, in an observer's mind out of proportion to what's actually happening. But in the person who's experiencing it for their own personal experience, they are actually reacting to a memory of a previous behavior. So I think it is important 
for us to talk to our staff about knowing problematic behavior and preparing for it and giving them some training and practice to help empower them in that. Realize that the interactions, depending in the community that you live in, could happen in the workplace, but they can also happen on social media, in encounters like in the grocery store or church or, or at school. And sometimes the responses, if you are a person who writes um, response letters to requests for reconsideration, you can get some very abusive behavior back at you in the responses to those letters. Okay, where are we? So um, the next part of the presentation for me is to just really start to <clears throat> run through some behaviors that, so I, I have to, I'm going to just slide back for just a second. Maybe I'm not, yeah. Okay. In the next part of the presentation, I'm going to talk about behaviors that we have seen being used by the community by the um, group in our community that is protesting the books, trying to remove the books. And I'm tying them to behaviors that are usually seen in domestic violence situations, whether that is partner, intimate partner violence or family violence. So this is my trigger warning because this might be very difficult to listen to, but I, 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 I always want to stop and do that caveat. I'm not trying to minimize anyone's experiences at all, but I am trying to point out that these behaviors are very similar. And so some of the ways of dealing with them that are often recommended to in a domestic situation might transfer to a professional situation to help empower staff better. So that being said, so here are some of the behaviors that we have seen here. The first one is character assassination, and that is the use of a smear campaign to destroy credibility as well as dissuade other supporters from speaking up because um, they see how terribly you are being maligned in public and don't want themselves to be that way. Some examples of this, we've been labeled um, pedophiles and groomers. Um, some of the letters that I've written in response to requests for reconsideration um, have been excerpted on social media with statements like Darcy Acord believes your children should, you know, learn about sex when they're four years old, whatever. Um, there have been excerpts on, of books on social media with a statement of outrage that the book is in the library or paid for by tax money, those kinds of things. The signs calling for resignation, blindsiding library management by approaching commissioners and community members first. Um, realize that in a situation of character assassination, this smear campaign could be happening even if you don't have any current materials challenges or program challenges. The smear campaign for us, I would say started, so I said the events started in July, 2021, but I know of looking back, hindsight being what it is, I know of rumblings that were happening within the community and I've learned of them since really the pandemic. And so, um, and we particularly had a very strange incident in our library in April of 2021 in conjunction with National Library Week that at the time seemed just weird, but now seems like it really did mean a lot more than, you know, hindsight um, being what it is, really did mean more than we um, attributed it, tr attributed to it at the time. Um, disinformation. Uh, this is the use of incorrect information in a purposeful attempt to mislead and persuade readers and listeners. That accusation that li the library has an agenda, um, creating false narratives about procedures in the library itself, creating an image of librarians as outsiders who threaten the community standards. This is purposeful. This is not what we as librarians typically encounter, which is just people misunderstanding and needing to have an explanation. And that's why when we go to that typical behavior of just let me reason with you, let me, let me you know, explain myself with you, it is unproductive. Um, it needs to be said here that at least in my community, um, I think people are being so persuaded by national groups 
hate groups with the, you know, with the money to really target them and really manipulate them that uh, they might be, you know, truly misinformed, those individual community members. But the overall emphasis of the people who are really in power is disinformation. Um, invention is creating a false narrative about problems that are actually non-existent. One of the favorite ones, not favorite, but one of the ones that I have found most harmful is a narrative that children are spending all their time reading pornography in the library. And that has been so harmful because this library is a safe place for kids to come. There isn't pornography, but I know that, um, I know that people there, there have been community members who have stopped coming to the library and that's just really very sad. Um, minimization is the use of verbal or other tactics to attempt to diffuse or reduce the perceived impact of a problematic behavior. So one of the ones that we continue to hear is that moving the books is common sense and library management is just being stubborn and then minimizing the whole um, impact of children and teens constitutional first amendment rights and stating that you know you would not be sued this is just something you would want to do to protect the teens or to protect the kids um, this can also be denial of abusive behavior and negating a real human emotional reaction. At one opportunity for testimony in front of the county commissioners, one of my colleagues started to cry naturally because it was just a very emotional time. We were about to lose quite a big chunk of funding um, and she started to cry. And in later social media excerpts, that example was held up as like a shameful thing that she was using crocodile tears to manipulate the commissioners. Um, blame shifting is placing the cause for problematic behavior on the victim rather than the perpetrator, as in the past example about crocodile tears. But also um, we have had in this community, a political narrative that says, well, elected officials are conservative. So the library should listen to the conservative faction of the county, almost as if the library is, um, you know, also elected or somehow should be swayed by uh, popularity. And then um, we did lose that funding that we were testifying about. And the responses were, well, if you'd have moved the books, you would still have the funding. You deserved that. In fact, I don't think I said this. We have one main branch here in Gillette and one um, so that's our main library and one branch library in a little town called Wright. And the funding in question is a 1% sales tax fund. Gillette lost its funding and Wright kept its funding because Wright did not have some of the books on the shelves that we have here just being the main library. They just are a much smaller system. And the, the um, comments were, well, Wright can have their funding because they're a clean library. So interesting blame shifting there. Um, again, power dynamics, using imbalances of power in any kind of relationship to influence actions. I don't think I'll go into this. You'll get these slides. And so if I haven't talked about something and you want to reach out and ask me what I meant about it, you're welcome to do that. I'm just trying to be cognizant of time here. Um, gaslighting is a big one. Gaslighting is the use of, um, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, the gaslighting is the use of lies or dishonesty to deny problematic behavior or make a victim question their reality. This is where psychological safety comes into play in a big way for, um, at least in my experience, for a lot of library staff members. So when we point out a problematic behavior, oftentimes a perpetrator will deny and say, you misunderstood what I said, or you did, I never actually said that. Leading staff members, leading victims to say, man, did, did they really say that or not? You know, kind of questioning our perceptions. Um, other examples of gaslighting, we've had a library board member tell us that the behavior of the book challenging group is not abusive, not serious. We just get our feelings hurt too easily. We just don't have thick enough skin. Um, 
which is not a thing to say to children's and teen librarians. And then using various statements of love when behavior is abusive. I mentioned to you, here's my example of that. I mentioned to you that in October of last year, our library board voted to disassociate from both the ALA and the WLA. And at that time, the, you know, the action was just so shocking. We hadn't really thought about the practicality of how that was going to play out. And so staff members, as you could imagine, were feeling um, alone, isolated, shocked. Those associations are so important for us as librarians, for networking, for rejuvenation, for um, just having like-minded people to talk to. The board member, one of the board members who voted to disassociate came in the next day and wanted my director to send an email out saying, we really do support the library staff. That's gaslighting. When you've just done something that is so disempowering, but then you try to cover it up with a statement of some sort of love or support. But this is dangerous because this leads to staff not trusting their impressions, not trusting their perceptions, not trusting their own lived experience and, and questioning um, whether or not they're crazy. And that is where psychological safety is most, I think, most at risk. That's where integrity is really breached in that relationship. Um, we can also, we have also seen triangulation, which is the technique of using people who are outside of the direct conflict to attack victims. So we'll see, I've, I've mentioned that we have staff members who are kind of in that state of cognitive dissonance where they know these people from other parts of their life and don't want to believe that they are actually engaging in, in, um, in some really abusive behaviors. So we've seen some of our staff members questioning policies and questioning collection decisions um, based on their, their affiliation with some of the same religious and social communities as the challengers. Um, we see a lot of use of shock tactics to persuade uninformed community members to believe false narratives. Um, here in Wyoming, as you might uh, imagine, county fairs are, are a big deal. And at the county fair in 2021. So just after this began, uh, the group, the the book challenging group, checked out a bunch of books from the public library, had them earmarked at the most salacious passages, set up a booth at the county fair trade show, and was just really, um, uh, you know, commandeering passers-by as they walked by this booth and saying, did you know this was available in the public library? Which for an uninformed community member, that can be pretty shocking. Um, and I think we are also seeing a lot of exploiting of natural protective qualities, toward, you know, tendencies towards children. A lot of, again, that narrative that makes parents question if they're doing something harmful to their child by, let, by bringing them to the public library, which is terrible. Um, we also have seen privacy violations. I've had things taken from my personal social media pages and show up on national websites with false narratives. We've had conversations recorded and posted online with false interpretation. Um, I've received emails from patrons across the country telling me to resign uh, based on, you know, those kinds of uh, false um, stories that they found on the internet. There have been uh, means of intimidation, uh, threats. There have been threats, which is, of course, means of intimidation to affect behavior. Some libraries have actually experienced terrible physically threatening behavior. I'm not speaking to that here because I don't want to um, get the information wrong. We have not. We have had people shouting at library staff members. We've had huge numbers of people crowding our hallways. Our library board meetings are held within our main library building. And so um, when it is the, the Monday of the month when it's time for a board meeting, the hallways will be crowded with people that we don't know. And that can be quite, that can feel very intimidating. Um, the protests and signs affect patrons who are entering the library. Unfortunately, that area where they need to crowd that hallway 
um, is our front lobby area. The meeting where the board, the, the room where the board meetings are held are just accessed off the front lobby area. And that has really affected patrons who have no, no idea what's going on as they're coming into the library saying, you know, what the heck's, what are all these signs and protests about? Um, we've had some email messages and, and phone calls with some dark threatening overtones and then the insinuation that job security is at risk. Um, and then finally, we've seen um, one another abusive behavior that it's important to talk about is isolation and dehumanizing. Um, isolation is the use of narratives or other tactics to make the victim into an outsider within the local community or group. We've seen so much an agenda that librarians, that the American Library Association have We've seen a narrative that states that we have an agenda that is outside local community standards. And in our community, there's been a lot of discussion about what local community standards are or should be, or who gets to determine those. Um, the disassociation was an isolating event because of the fact that, as I stated, we as librarians rely on those networks to be cut off from them is extremely isolating. Um, dehumanizing is the effect of isolation to make the outsider into a less than human category, which enables other people to be abusive without regret. We see this everywhere, but we are seeing it in the current context of book banning and book challenging. And I think that's what defines this one as very different from things we've seen in you know maybe recent history, not from every book challenging um, movement we've seen in library history, however. Um, we are with the dehumanizing is that idea that librarians are pedophiles, are predators, are somehow um, just very um, untrustworthy people. And along with that is the dehumanization of marginalized populations and their allies. So as librarians, we stand up for everyone. We have collections that reflect everyone. Um, we, uh, our, our, our focus would be to be, I think, an ally for everyone. And so when marginalized populations are dehumanized as they absolutely have been in this community, so are the allies that stand up and, and um, speak up for them. And then all of this, all of these techniques elicit emotional responses in the victims with the goal of influencing behavior. So, that we are trying, we are seeing the book challenging groups trying to um, elicit fear in the people who listen to their narratives and their rhetoric, playing on parents, as I said, natural fears for their children, nat natural instinct to protect them, playing on staff members' fears of job repercussions. There's been a lot of shame uh, bandied about, which will play on cultural or religious discomfort in discussing sex. We are a very conservative state. And so there is a lot of um, shame around discussions of sex in our community, um, in, the, in the groups that we're seeing. And then of course, as I said earlier, some staff members have been triggered by the similarities of these behaviors to past traumatic events in their lives. So that even though the current event might not be as awful as what they experienced before, because the behaviors are so similar, they are having um, traumatic reactions. They're having natural emotional reactions to that memory. That, again, this is a repeat slide, that um, has led to these library staff responses again. So maybe it's a little easier to see why these responses have come up, but just to sort of talk through them again, um, I did add one here, but there's confusion at being maligned the way that we've been, an attempt to correct misinformation, a desire to reason with people, emotional responses, self-censoring or 
an attempt to placate, an attempt to people please, because that's a very common trauma-based response, taking on too much of the fight, a sense of overwhelm, the cognitive dissonance, the wishful thinking, and the exodus from the profession. So what can we do? Is there anything that we can do? Okay. So um, I think as we, as we, the next part of this presentation is going to sort of look at some, I, I think we can have these discussions with our staff, with one another, but also just some reflective things that we might need to think about as individual humans as we are working in libraries. So some big picture discussions to have with with staff, with yourselves, um, what is your why? What is the aspect of your career or position that is the most value of the most value to you? In domestic situations, particularly in an intimate partner situation, um, oftentimes this is a big one. What's your why? Why? What? You know? Why are you? trying to heal this? Why are you trying to get away from this? Like, what's your end goal? And I think that that's an important discussion for us as librarians. What is our why in this whole situation? Can you play the long game and what does that look like? I don't, as I stated earlier, think that this particular issue is going to be resolved soon. I do think it's something that's going to have to go through um, legislation and courts, and in some places that's already beginning to happen. What interactions are worth engagement and what are not? Um, I mentioned that they there was a, a flurry in about the spring of 2022 of just questioning all kinds of library policies and procedures. And there were lots of statements of disinformation about silly things in the library, like, you know, the fact that we deselect books, that we were just throwing out books, all of those kinds of things. I chose not to engage because I was just so involved in the intellectual freedom part of it. Some engage, some interactions are just not worth engagement. Um, I think in domestic situations, you learn that too. This is important. What behaviors are contributing to your credibility as a professional? I, because of the emotional nature of this and the just very full on, it felt like a frontal, a full frontal attack for a while. We had staff members talking about it at public desks. We had staff members um, like being, being truly um, out of control of some emotional responses. And the problem with that, it's understandable from a from a trauma based perspective. It's certainly understandable. But the problem with that is that it diminishes credibility as a professional. So I had to get really firm with my staff and and, you know, just say, no, there's no discussion of this issue at public desks. No, you can't talk about this topic, you know, unless you're away from from the the main part of the library and you're in a safe place. I think also for individual reflection is the question of whose opinions really matter to you? Who, who are your tribe? Whose opinions really matter? Because this is absolutely a case of, we will not please everybody in this situation. Um, oops, excuse me. Okay. Um, I think if, if you're in a situation where maybe none of this has really started or, or maybe there are some rumblings, it would be, and this is maybe more for managers or directors to think about who, who might be um, in the position to do this work, who are the safe members of your community and think about whether there are people who are willing to take active roles in support of the library and the library system. Uh, for a year, we really were trying to refute the, the disinformation on our own and just so felt so alone in the fight. Uh, we did get finally a group organized who took on 
um, and they do so much, um, took on making comments at public meetings, watching newspaper articles and responding to all of the comments and, and, um, and uh, misinformation that came up there writing letters to the editor. And it just felt like a very big weight lifted off of our shoulders so that we were not fighting the fight all by ourselves. Also, what coalitions can you build with professional organizations? That um, attempt to remove the obscenity exemption from our criminal code that came up last year in our legislative session was mostly um, disabled by testimony from a coalition of educators, librarians, museum professionals, university professionals, that um, even child psychologists and things like that, that really was a, a group of like-minded organizations that were facing some similar issues. You may not you know, have all of the same values, but can you caucus towards some sort of a coalition where you can present a united front. And then can you educate your community about library services and policies and values? We did not do enough of this. We did not do enough talking about, you know, we have a collection development policy and it states this and, you know, things like that. So, and who can help with that? Um, prior to difficult interactions, again, uh, maybe have some conversations with frontline staff redefining what good customer service looks like so that it prioritizes safety, personal safety, other staff members' safety, citizen and patron safety. In other words, the people who are just in the building right then, but are not necessarily coming at you with an abusive comment or coming at you with um, a, a complaint and then engage with customer service. It might not be you. If you are not personally safe to have that interaction, that's the first step is maybe seeing if somebody else can take that interaction for you. Empower staff that they don't have to engage with abusive behavior, that they don't have to just sit back and take it, that they can choose to not engage with that patron if the behavior is abusive. Prior to difficult interactions, some canned phrases can be used to shift focus away from the frontline staff because oftentimes they are not the people who have any ability to make a decision anyway. So I will share these slides. I'm not gonna read all of these, but say empowering staff to practice and say things like, I'm not the person you need to speak to about that, or I can offer you our request for reconsideration form, but I am not able to have a further conversation with you about this issue. Things like that, that they can maybe practice with one another and get comfortable saying will help to um, shift that abusive behavior away from them, maybe to a manager, but a manager or a supervisor usually is in more of a position to handle that. If there are moments of tension, I think there are some phrases that a patron to use when patron, for example, comes in and starts reading excerpts from a book or using inflammatory comments in a public space. Um, that's an odd thing to say out loud. Can I help you with something related to the library? Uh, if they're reading, we've had some success with saying your tone is threatening, please stop. Your body language is threatening, please stop but don't comment that the material is inappropriate to read out loud because that just comes back and is used against you in the case of, um, you know, we've had patrons try to read books at public comment and have been shut down. Obviously not all books are meant to be read out loud, but that's not, a, that's not an argument that has any bearing with this, in my experience with this particular group. Um, you are disturbing this environment. You're disturbing other patrons. Please stop. You know what? If you don't have an actual library need, I'm going to need to help another patron or I'm going to need to return to my work. And that helps a little bit in those really weird conversations where, where patrons are trying to kind of get you to say something that is, um, you know, homophobic or transphobic or that is against the library. Just this isn't a library need. I'm going to have to go back to my work. In moments of tension, um, try to keep interactions related to library business. There is a technique that's taught in, um, in dealing with domestic um, uh, situations that's called gray rock, and you can look it up, but it is actually 
being as boring and as affectless as possible, realizing that your emotional response to their attack is maybe adding fuel to the fire. And so it's something that you would want to just minimize. And so it can be as simple as being very civil and polite in answering the questions, but not engaging in any emotional interaction, not engaging in pleasantries, just being as boring as possible. Again, avoid attempting to educate citizens who are just not willing or able to listen um, without, I, 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 I'm assuming you all are aware of implicit biases and have probably had training about that, but recognize that they have some big implicit biases here that are absolutely affecting their behavior. So slow down and ask if you can even be effective in engaging with some of these people who are coming at you with these abusive or inflammatory comments. Refer them to the management if possible. In the moment, it does not help to know some breathing or meditation techniques. Um, if you're standing at a desk, one that I love when I'm um, in, a, in an uncomfortable situation is just lifting one heel at, the, at a time and just focusing on your, on your feet as you're having that conversation. It's grounding and it helps, but I'm not any kind of a meditation teacher. So I, I know that you can find those resources yourself. And as I've already stated, don't have that interaction alone if it's at all possible. Um, for So for supervisors and managers in the building, that's something to think about. After the moment of tension, can you decompress? Because you've just been flooded with these emotions, with all kinds of adrenaline and things like that. And you need to somehow let that out. Can there, is there somebody else who can let you take a break to walk outside, to go get a cup of coffee, whatever it might be, go get a drink of water, but then document that interaction. The reason you're documenting that is twofold. You are gonna report to supervisors as soon as possible with documentation, what happened, but you are also gonna document so that you can identify and name the behaviors so that you don't start succumbing to the gaslighting so that you can keep your own psychological safety intact by saying, yes, they really did say this, this, and this. They really did do these things. I'm not overreacting. I'm not crazy. Other considerations for staff members, recognizing the personal experiences that might be affecting your response is important. Can you maintain professionalism? Um, you need to know what what your limits are and maybe do some of the work that's necessary to um, practice phrases or whatever it might be so that you can maintain a professional affect in the moment. Um, the engagement outside of the work environment is an interesting question. In our small town, it's almost impossible for people to not engage. It's discouraged. But, you know, you still have staff who just feel compelled to try to have that one conversation with that one person who certainly can be convinced. Um, that's an important conversation, I think, for individual systems to have with management about engagement. Will you support your staff talking to people outside of the work environment and staff members? Is this something you are even willing to take on? What boundaries do you need to set? What privacy protections do you need to have in place on your social media or in other parts of your life? Managers, um, I'm gonna probably, checking my time here. We have a few minutes. Um, if you are engaged in conversations or written responses to requests for reconsideration, I think it's valuable to craft statements ahead of time that can be your talking points and to really think about philosophy, mission, and how you do collections ahead of time. The getting down in the weeds and arguing about each book on each book's merits in my experience has not been productive. We need to elevate that conversation and have it be about First Amendment, about constitutional librarianship, about readers' rights. Those kinds of statements that are really at the core of this, um, of this whole controversy. And then I think using those talking points 
in reactive situations when someone is coming at you, but also as marketing in proactive situations before we, you know, before this maybe blows up is smart um, and something to, to really be thinking about doing. Uh, if you are having a conversation with patrons about books, again, avoid the arguing. I think I got ahead of myself. I, ap I apologize. Um, stick to general statements about the library mission and collection development policy. Also about the professionalism of selectors and book reviewers and how books re relate to your collection development. If you're doing written response to challenges, I think a template developed from the statements that you've already crafted can save some time and also lend um, consistency to what you're writing. So that's something to give consideration to. It should include a statement of a public library's neutrality. It should include probably some data about the individual title being um, challenged, which would include professional reviews, where other libraries in your system have placed it, any awards. But those that data is chosen to support that the title fits in the collection development policy. It, it's it just you're really just arguing that we've got this policy that says we'll collect these materials and this title fits in it. It's not necessarily a statement of the merits of the title, although it may be construed as that um, by the persons receiving that letter. Um, uh, in my experience. Some of the patrons' accusations or points about the books were so far afield, we knew that they did not read the books. And I think that that's another piece of the pattern. They are, again, reacting to excerpts from books, but not reading the entire book. There's so much misunderstanding and misinformation. Um, I don't think it's ever productive to belittle someone for their lack of understanding or to shame them back for not having read the book. It's tempting but maybe statements that just refute the points in a real um, unemotional way. So I, these are a couple that I used repeatedly um, just to in, indicate that a thorough reading of the book shows that your point is not valid. Um, other considerations for management, uh, please recognize that some of your staff may be more affected by these interactions than others, and that, of course, includes any staff member who is part of the marginalized groups who are being targeted, but not just them, because what we see on the surface or what we know of someone's identity doesn't always belie everything that they've been through in their past, and so that's where trauma-informed knowledge comes in. Revisit your protocols for desk coverage and building security. So what are you doing to help your staff feel more safe and more empowered? What's your own transparency with staff? One of the things that my former director did was try to protect us by not telling us a lot of what was going on. That led to just a general feeling of unease. In a domestic situation, right? The kids always know something's up even if their parents haven't spoken to them about it directly. So. If you're able to be transparent with staff with privacy considerations in place, I think I think staff deserve that. Um, I think also transparency regarding resources is important. Um, if you're in a system where, for example, a lot of youth materials are being challenged, we're in a small system. So youth materials are being challenged, but the people who are having to answer the questions are primarily the frontline circulation staff, then that puts them at a disadvantage if they're not familiar with the resources. So one of the things that I did was just copy my response letters to the various requests for reconsideration with all personal information redacted. And I had those response letters available as a binder so that people could read through my responses. There were, you know, about 29 titles that we had challenged through the fall of 2021, and it felt like a lot. But as they were able to read through my letters, they could kind of start to see patterns and feel more secure in just, um, you know, knowing that uh, none of what was being said about the youth materials was actually true. Again, determine what's acceptable for staff engagement outside of work environment and then craft consistent messaging, those talking points, so that staff is using them. 
Uh, other considerations for managers, are your staff adequately, ad adequately educated about library service? those pieces that I talked about, do you have an information or credibility risk that needs to be taken care of? If there are trainings you can implement with assertiveness training, with safety, with communication techniques or intellectual freedom, per perhaps now is the time to think about that. And this work requires a lot of work. And so how can that load be shared? It's not just the reading the books that are challenged and responding to requests for reconsideration, although that itself is a lot of work, but it is having that marketing campaign, having that consistent messaging. It's also perhaps pulling reports from your ILS to show circulation numbers, lots of those kinds of things that might not be part of our normal day-to-day, -day, but will become part of the workload. Okay. Um, so some vinyl considerations, and I think I'm finishing a little bit earlier than I had intended, but that's okay. Some vinyl considerations. So the reality of the situation, I think just facing and identifying the reality is in itself empowering. Um, this isn't something that I think will go away anytime soon. So that shifts us from trying to solve the problem in the moment to thinking long-term. Uh, blaming isn't going to help anyone, particularly self-blame. You may have made mistakes. I certainly did when I first started dealing with this. You just have to kind of forgive yourself for being human, start where you can. Our values are really important. Our values are the constitutional, um, the, the values of constitutional librarianship, and they really do matter. And the small steps that we make matter, and we will all learn together. This is just one, I think, piece that I felt like wasn't being talked about enough, but it certainly isn't all, you know, it's not all of the puzzle. It's not all of what we need to learn together. You'll get my slides. This is my contact information. Um, that's my personal email. I, I try not to do a whole lot on my work email with this work, um, simply because I'm in a county system and I don't want FOIA requests on that. Um, oh. Looks like I have an extra digit in my zip code. I'm sorry about that. It should say 82718. That middle eight is incorrect. The phone number at the bottom is my um, office phone number and you can call me and leave a message if you wanna talk as well. And so I'm going to now stop sharing and turn it back over to Geneve. Oh, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm sorry. Um, so I'm not seeing any questions in the Q&A. Um, so I know that during the progression of your slides, you had said there, there were some things that you didn't delve as deeply into um, in the interest of time. Is there anything that you want to expand upon uh, while we wait for some questions to drop in the, in the Q&A? Um, and I can't even remember when I made that comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, I uh, think I think it was because you were so so thorough in your presentation. I definitely had some questions that I crossed out because you answered them a okay. little bit later. Um, okay. But I I can also ask you, um, do you have any insight onto how the kids or the youth are feeling about all of these things that are taking place in Wyoming? Like, do they actually have a voice in this conversation? No, not really. Um, so, so of course my presentation is focused on empowering staff, um, kids and teens. I have had, I've had primarily interactions with our teens and at the beginning, as I kind of stated, like we had so many like protesters out in front of the library and signs. And so we naturally had a lot of teens who would come to the teen room and say, what's going on, that kind of thing. Some of those were teens who identified in the marginalized population that was really being targeted. And again, the rhetoric has shifted, but it's still, I think, um, uh, targeting LGBTQIA plus people. Some of those teens responded by wanting to speak up and um, most responded by wanting to um, being afraid, by being afraid. 
So I, I, we have actually had some situations where teens have spoken at library board meetings and they're very brave teenagers who have tried to have a voice, but they've been very much dismissed. And that's an unfortunate side effect, I think, of um, just an underlying philosophy that kids and teens don't know what's best for them. And so it's very interesting, the, the narrative that's being developed here and how it then leads um, to kids and teens being very, very disempowered. But the narrative is that libraries and educators are indoctrinating children. Children could not possibly make these decisions for themselves. They don't know what's best for them. Lots and lots of that kind of talk. Um, and even trying to have a conversation about the very true fact that kids and teens have First Amendment rights, that the First Amendment is not age related, is so inflammatory that we've we've tried to we've really kind of backed away from it because it just doesn't go anywhere in this conversation. Um, then then that turns into you're infringing on my parental rights. And it's just it's very it's really, really um, indicative of some very deep um, philosophies. So the kids and teens who have spoken up, I don't think that they've had any necessarily very um, public shaming or anything like that, but they've been absolutely invalidated as in, oh, you're just kids or you're just teens. You don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. And then again, a lot of them know that they'll be ostracized in school like this is unfortunately this is through the community and so a lot of them are just not speaking up because they're afraid if you look at Gillette Wyoming you can look at some pretty dark facts about this community and its history so in some ways it makes sense that this all kind of came to a head here um but we have not been kind to outsiders in this community for yeah, yeah. Um, so some questions have come in, um, and the first one is, um, so was this just about LGBTQ plus books, or was this just relating to that, um, or or any book that had suggestive titles and content? So of the 29 books that were formally challenged, and then there have been books that have just been talked about since then, um, the majority were... Uh, had LGBTQIA content. But if you know much about particularly human development and sex ed resources for kids and teens in the last however many years, they've become much more inclusive of all gender identities and all sexual orientations. And so that's what's interesting. And I think that's what's a twist of the rhetoric. Now we're having a problem with sexually explicit materials that talk about sex acts, that talk about um, contraception, those kinds of things. But I still think it's because they're inclusive of an LGBTQIA plus experience. Um, so the majority, yes. We've had one book that was challenged because it had Wicca and one book that was challenged because I, I don't even know. Um, it was a children's nonfiction book about a doctor, a female doctor in the Civil War who wore pants. And it was challenged because it was supposedly um, some of this is, is the level of ridiculous that you cannot actually make this up. But it was supposedly promoting transgenderism. And this is in a state where most of the women are, you know, miners and ranchers and farmers, and mm. they wear a lot of pants. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so our next question is, what is your why, especially going through everything that you have faced? Um, it's the intellectual freedom. It's the fact that kids and teens deserve 
information that they need, whatever that might be, and it and both for the recreational and the educational piece. Uh, I mentioned that I was an educator for a while, and um, just because of how life works, I left public education because my family moved, and I happened to come to librarianship, and it was like coming home because I no longer had to say, oh, well, I wish you could read that book that you like, but no, I have to, you know, the curriculum says we have to read this book. Kids and teens deserve to be engaged in whatever resources and information that they need for wherever they're at in their life. And that might include something as silly as being able to sign on to their Roblox account. That's really big <laughs> here. Or, you know, real information about, I think I might be gay. How do I know? You know, or, or whatever that might be. My, my why is the intellectual freedom, the rights to intellectual freedom that we all share regardless of age. And yes, Roblox, I feel like is popular everywhere right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so our next question, can you re recommend any specific resources such as books, websites, trainers, et cetera, to use to empower staff in all the ways you mentioned here? Things that you relied on, I'm sorry. Um, things that you relied on during your move, uh, your movements through this terrible time. Um, so I have, uh, I mentioned um, to Paula earlier, I have a document of resources that is sort of a tip of the iceberg kind of thing, but might start people um, to, you know, look into um uh, a lot of looking into the abusive behaviors and understanding what that is, that emotional manipulation, how that plays out, um, some trauma-informed resources and some assertiveness training resources. So that'll get shared with the group. Um, I'm, I'm almost, I'm always hesitant to share resources with librarians because I, I want to say, this is just a start. Like, I don't think this is thorough, but it will get shared and hopefully get you started in some directions. Um, because of personal experiences, I was able to identify a lot of those behaviors um, as they were happening. And that helped me navigate it with myself and my staff. Um, but honestly, I wouldn't, if you had asked me that question 10 years ago, I wouldn't have been able to do that. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting because I've never heard the comparison between this mm -hmm. um, confrontation and domestic violence. So I mm -hmm. think we've all learned a lot with that parallel and just providing those specific examples of how to combat it, I think has been very helpful for everyone. Thank you. Um, and and again, I never want to minimize somebody's personal experience. So I, that's where I get, I just want to say that. Okay, what else? Um, some challengers I've had aren't with the group necessarily, but have a list that they've gotten online, and we've not realized what they're doing until they've requested all the books on their list. It probably falls under the rest of the advice you've given us for dealing with book challenges, but any advice specifically for dealing with book banning lists or recognizing when someone is deliberately working off a list? Um, I so we've revised our, recon our request for reconsideration forms to include, have you read the entire book? What passages in particular do you, are you having a problem with? Because you'll often find that if they're working off of a list, they're not reading the material at all. Um, that would be one piece of advice. I also would go out and search for the list. They're not hard to find. You can look at Moms for Liberty. You can look at booklooks.org, which is a rating system that's backed by Moms for Liberty. Um, you can look at Mass Resistance. That's the national group that has the most influence in my community. And you'll see those common books um, coming up over and over. One thing that some systems in the state, some, some groups in the state have tried to do is create um, like Facebook pages where for every book that they find on <clears throat> some of these lists, they put out, and, and there's, um, Laramie County School District in Cheyenne has done a fabulous job of this. 
some people who, who they're not, it's not the school librarians, but people who are supporters, um, they will put the actual professional reviews, the actual awards, the actual criteria and reasons for those books being in the collection in a post. And then that at least is putting out some factual information about those titles. Um, it, it's, that's a hard thing to get ahead of, but it might be something where um, some of those, if you, if you come across those lists, and you can kind of proactively start to um, develop your reasons for why those books are on your lists that might, rather than just sitting back and waiting for somebody mm -hmm. to challenge them, it might be helpful for that. Um, we also had a, we had a newspaper, it's, it's interesting your allies, but a newspaper reporter when Mouse was banned in Kentucky, who tried to bring a community group together to have a book discussion. I'm sorry, I have a very loud cat and he's upstairs. Um, <laughs> have a book discussion about Mouse. Um, I don't know if it really did what he thought it was going to do, but that's another, I've seen other places do that where they're finding these lists and they're saying, let's, let's actually all read this book and talk about it. And that might be a proactive approach. Um, as far as stopping them from checking out all the books. I don't know that one could do that and still be, you know, professionally ethical. So I don't know that there's anything to be done about that. And then I guess also just, you know, really reinforcing that, you know, hopefully you have a good request for reconsideration policy in place. And I think it's important to say that as librarians, we don't have a problem with someone you know, requesting that we look at a book and, and engaging in a conversation about why the book is placed where it is. It's right. the abusive tactics and the shaming and the emotional content that's thrown at us in the context of having the books on the shelves in the first place. Right. Um, how do you believe rulings from things like like the below will impact library policies. A New Jersey father filed a federal lawsuit to block a state policy aimed at keeping schools from outing transgender students to their parents. I don't know if I know enough about that to comment. So I don't know that I'm the person to talk to about that, mm -hmm. but um we're having those same sorts of discussions here in Wyoming too. Um, have you heard anything from the authors? How are they handling book bans? Um, I've had some conversation. I have not had conversation directly with authors um, <clears throat> that we have had books, the authors of books that we have had challenged. Ellen Hopkins, I, un, interestingly enough, nothing has been challenged yet, although it's certainly been bandied about in public comment. Um, I have had conversations with her, and of course, she's offered to send any materials that we need about how her books have helped kids psychologically, you know, because she has so many fan letters from kids. Uh, I have had authors in the community. We have visiting authors who um, have tried. I mean, they haven't, you know, preached a sermon, but they've tried to gently um, in their presentations weave in the idea of intellectual freedom. Um, we did contact uh, one of my friends uh, at the library did have a contact with Corey Silverberg because sex is a funny word is one that is getting challenged a lot. And he was looking into whether, you know, taking the excerpts and posting them online would be any kind of a, a copyright violation, but I don't know whether he ever followed through with anything there. So. Well, thank you so much, um, Darcy, for your presentation. And thank you to everyone who attended today. This has been a great conversation. Um, we look forward to seeing everyone at the next virtual conference session. 
which is striving beyond ADA compliance starting at 1130 a.m. Everyone have a wonderful rest of your day and I hope you all enjoy the rest of conference. Thank you guys. Thank you all for having me. Good luck. <laughs>